we've arrived in ancient Shiloh and on the road here we pass this sign which has been here for a very long time. It's a track leading through to an Arab village. But since the Israelis have constructed a kibbutz near here, they've laid a tar-sealed road. The reason we're here is that this is the site where the Israelites erected the first sanctuary when they arrived in the Promised Land. Recently, some archaeological excavations have found some very definite proof to back up the Bible story. As recently as 1986, archaeologist Israel Finkelstein had a report published in the Biblical Archaeology Review in which he reported his excavations here at Shiloh. And they provide us with some very interesting evidence, especially in relationship to the biblical account. But in order for us to be able to understand what it's all about, I think I'd better explain to you something about archaeology. You know, whenever I come to the Middle East and am involved in the excavations and get back home again, I suppose you can guess the question my friends ask me as soon as they meet me. Hey, did you find anything? What did you find? And I say, yes, yes, we found a lot of things, a lot of broken pottery. <laughs> and they say, big deal, is that all you went to the Middle East for? But you see, archaeologists are not looking for treasures. Okay, it's very nice if you find a golden vase or an alabaster god or something, but really that's not we're lo what we're looking for. And that is not what provides us with the information we need. We are trying to reconstruct history. Archaeologists are digging up the past and they're trying to reconstruct the past. Now, in order to understand just how it all works, I'll need to explain it from a diagram. But first, I have to explain to you what is a tell. The word tell is the name given to a deserted mound, or sometimes it's even still occupied in the Middle East, and there's plenty of these tells. And this is how it all happened. You see, in ancient times, cities or villages were usually built on low hills for defensive purposes. It was much easier to defend if the enemy had to come up the side of a hill, you see, to attack a town or a city. Well, people living on such a low hill would build their houses here, let's illustrate it this way, and they would have their floor level like that. And in those days, of course, there were no garbologists or rubbish collectors, and so whatever rubbish they had, broken pottery or uh, bits and pieces, dust and uh, rubbish, was just thrown out the front door. Well, you can imagine what happened. Little by little, the street level outside began to rise. And eventually, it reached the height of the floor level of the house. So guess what happened when there was a downpour of rain? Well, that's when Mama caught hold of Papa and screwed his ear and said, listen, you've got to do something about that because all the rain is coming in the front door. So good obliging Papa did something. What he did was simply to raise the floor level, bring in some more earth and raise the floor level. And uh, that was fine for a while, but of course the rubbish still began to accumulate, and so it, the whole thing happened again, you see. And sometimes a wall collapsed, sometimes the roof fell in. All they did was simply level it off and build on top. And so the level of this whole hill began to rise. And in different periods of the history of this tell, or hill, we have what we call archaeological strata and it goes this way. First of all was the period when they used stone implements, stone axes, stone knives and stone pots and vessels you see and so it is called the Stone Age or it is known as the Lithic period. Now usually this is given a date for the beginning of this something like 200,000 BC. Some people even put it at 2 million. This is pure supposition and I don't go along with this, but I'm telling you what is usually uh, considered to be. 
Then man began to discover how to use copper, smelt pot, uh, copper. And so we have the beginning of the bronze or copper period. And uh, little by little we have uh, an intermingling and so we have what is known as the Calcolithic period when you have both copper and stone. And then bronze became more common and so we have beginning of what we call the Bronze Age. First of all, there was the early Bronze Age, which is usually dated about 3100 BC. And then we have the Middle Bronze Age, which is usually doubted, uh, dated to about 2100 BC. And then we have the Late Bronze Period, which is usually dated to about 1550 BC and then we have the Iron Age which is usually dated to about 1200 BC and then of course we have uh, strata building up on top of that. Well now when an archaeologist sinks a shaft down here or a trench down here he exposes all these different strata and from the type of pottery that he sees in each stratum, he can determine which stratum he is working in. Now, the way he can do that is because of the different pottery styles. You see, fashion's changed, and so uh, an archaeologist can identify the different styles. For instance, sometimes they just had little rounded pots like this with, uh, with flat bottoms on them, and then uh, they learn to put handles on them, and uh, make them a little ornamented, you know, put scratches and designs in them. Then there was a period when they used pots with pointed ends like this. You might say, well, well they'd fall over, wouldn't they? No, they had a little hole in the, uh, in the house's floor and it just sat there. Or maybe they had a piece of wood with a hole in it and they just sat it like that. You say not very convenient, but nevertheless, that's the way they did it, you see. So when uh, an archaeologist finds a piece of pottery from any of these, he can say, right, I know where it is, what age it is, you see. Another very good method of determining it is, if you can find them, are uh, oil lamps. Now at first they were just round saucers with a wick on the side, you see, and the oil there. Later on, the potters learned to pinch it like that, you see, and put the wick here with the oil in there. Then they got a little more refined and they made the top enclosed like this with a spout. And then they got the idea of making designs on it. So you see how fashions change? And so when the archaeologist finds these different uh, pieces of pottery here, he can say, right, this is the early bronze, this is the middle bronze. But what he cannot tell is the exact date of these. The only way he can date any of this pottery is by relating it to the chronology of Egypt. And so if he finds something in the early bronze, he says, oh, well, the early bronze period in Egypt began about 3100 BC, and the middle bronze here. Well, the problem is this. If Egyptian chronology is correct, that's fine. You've got the right dates here. But if there is a mistake in Egyptian chronology, as I believe there is, well, then these dates are going to be wrong too. And that is where we come to Shiloh and notice the interesting discovery that was made recently here in the excavations. You see, according to this lineup here, the Exodus took place 1445 BC or the invasion of Palestine 1405 BC and that would place it in the late Bronze period. But in the excavations in Shiloh, no evidence of occupation was found there during the late Bronze period. There was, however, evidence of a sanctuary during the middle Bronze period. Now, I consider that is where the Israelite invasion took place. In other words, I consider these dates need to be shortened. And the Israelite invasion took place in 2100 BC. Then, if we accept that reconstruction, we have exactly what we're looking for, evidence of a sanctuary in Shiloh in the Middle Bronze period. Well now, the important thing about these excavations, and these men did a wonderful job by the way, I, I personally think they did a great job here in Shiloh, and they established the 
identification of the various strata, and that's very important. You see, by finding pieces of pottery, here, for instance, is a piece here of a large jar, uh, they can identify which particular period it comes from. And it is my personal opinion that the Israelite invasion took place at the end of the early Bronze period, that would be about 1400 BC. And that being the case, this just fits in with what they found in the excavations. You, you just wouldn't believe it. It's just so supportive of the biblical record. Now, here in Shiloh, in, if I'm correct, in this Middle Bronze period, we would expect to find evidence that there was a sanctuary here, that this is where the place of worship was. And this is exactly what they found. Listen, I'll read it to you from this report which they have made. And it says here on page 39 of the report, I think it is, yes, here we go. There are accumulating indications of cultic continuity at the site from the Middle Bronze II period onward. A sanctuary probably stood here as early as the Middle Bronze Age. Do you see how that fits in? So, if that is correct, and of course the archaeologists are right spot on there, if that is correct, well then that is exactly what we would expect to find, a sanctuary here. Now, somebody might say, yes, but that was probably a Canaanite sanctuary that was here before the Israelites turned up. I don't accept that. Do you mean to say that the Israelites would choose a place that was already a place of worship for heathen religion and say, right, we'll put God's sanctuary here? Oh, I, I just can't see that. And so here, the first evidence of occupation is in the Middle Bronze period. <coughs> and I would say that is where the Israelites came and pitched their sanctuary right here. Here is the model of the sanctuary which Mr. Winterton has made. And he's done a beautiful job, don't you think? It's all made according to scale and uh, it's according to the biblical dimensions. He himself is arrayed in the high priest's robes and they're very beautiful, aren't they? And these also, according to the biblical instructions, I'll explain all about that in a little while. But first of all, just let's have a look at the sanctuary and its environs. This was, was originally erected, of course, at the foot of Mount Sinai. Later on, as the Israelites traveled along, they took this with them. It could be completely dismantled and carried by certain priests which were allocated to the task and re-erected at each site. Then the Israelites in their 12 tribes camped around about all in a prescribed place. They had their standards under which they assembled and pitched their tents all in a very orderly way. And then we notice that on the outside here, there was a linen uh, cloth going right around the outside on portable poles and this courtyard was altogether a hundred cubits long and 50 cubits wide. Now for your information a cubit is approximately half a meter so that meant that here you've got a distance of about 50 meters along here and at the front there was an entrance here and uh, the people could come in here, priests could come in here daily for their official functions and uh, so we now transfer our attention to what was inside here and I'll ask Mr Winterton if he'd just like to remove the gateway or curtain at the front there. Right, thank you very much. Now we can see the altar of sacrifice. Uh, this was a big bronze altar and on this, the daily sacrifice was offered. About nine o'clock in the morning, three o'clock every afternoon, there was a lamb or a sheep was offered here as a sacrifice and it was completely consumed, uh, symbolizing the nation's dedication to Yahweh or Jehovah. And also, day by day, people who felt a sense of guilt and who wanted to show their faith in the forgiving love of God would bring along a lamb or a goat or some sacrifice here. Poor people even were allowed to bring along a, a, a pigeon. And uh, so they could bring these sacrifices along here. The sinner would lay his hands on the head of the sacrifice and then he himself was obliged to slay the animal and then the blood was transferred inside and the uh, fat of that animal was burnt up on the altar. The animal itself was disposed of outside the sanctuary. Now, beyond that, in between the altar of sacrifice and the sanctuary itself, there was a laver 
uh, and this was a laver that contained water so that the priests, before going into the sanctuary, very important, they cleansed their uh, bodies, and so before approaching God, they had to be physically clean as well as spiritually pure, and so they washed there, and then they went into the sanctuary. Now, the sanctuary itself was covered by four layers of uh, garments, cloth, what shall we call them? And uh, I'm going to ask Mr. Winterton to take these off one by one. Now, this first one was made of seal skins, and this, of course, is waterproof, and so it kept the sanctuary dry in time of uh, rain, because they did get rain there, you know. And uh, then there was uh, some ram skins dyed red, and that was the next covering. Thank you. And then the next one was of goat hair. The tents are still made of that, you know, in the Middle East today, Palestine. They still make their tents of goat's hair. And so there was this goat's hair covering. And finally, there was the pure white linen garment, which uh, covered the whole of the sanctuary. So there were these four coverings of the sanctuary building itself. Now, the building itself was 30 cubits long and 10 cubits wide and 10 cubits high. This building also was made of wood covered with gold plate and this also was portable. It could be completely dismantled and carried by the appropriate priests and then reassembled at the site on which it was pitched. And inside the sanctuary, incidentally, there were a curtain, there was a curtain here. Thank you, Mr. Winterton, if you'd like to take that off. There was two veils or curtains. One was at the entrance of the sanctuary and the other one was into the inner apartment of the sanctuary. Now, there were these two apartments. The first one was 20 cubits by 10 cubits, and it had three articles of furniture in, and the other one was 10 cubits by 10 cubits, and this just had one item of furniture inside. Now, so that we can get a better look at this, uh, remember it's portable, we're just going to lift the whole sanctuary building up. Thank you. And then we can see inside. First, we notice a table here called the table of showbread. Now, this had 12 loaves of bread on it, which were replaced every Sabbath. They symbolized the 12 tribes of Israel. Then over on this side were the seven golden candlesticks, and they were burning continuously. They had oil in them running from inside, and they had wicks, and the high priest came in here every day and trimmed the wicks and uh, filled up the oil so as to keep these lights burning, seven. Then here was an altar of incense. And here again, the high priest came in here every morning and every evening at the time of the morning and evening sacrifice, and he burned incense on this altar. This incense used to curl up and go into the inner apartment of the sanctuary. And so the incense here uh, represented the prayers that were being offered by the people who are outside waiting for the priest to perform his duties. Now, let us look at the item on the inside of the sanctuary in the inner apartment, and that is the Ark of the Covenant, or the Ark of the Testament. It was a wooden box gilded with gold, and inside were the two tables of the law, the Ten Commandments, that had been written with the finger of God on Mount Sinai. And on the top of the Ark of the Covenant, there were two beautiful golden angels with wings outstretched, reaching over and touching each other. And so that was the only item of furniture in the inner apartment of the sanctuary. Now, the high priest only went in there once a year, but a very significant service, and we'll be explaining that in our next subject, the next topic. Now, the high priest's garments were very beautiful and I would like to explain them to you. The high priest must have made a very impressive sight in all his God-given robes, and they were God-given, you know, because God specified everything that the high priest had to wear. It was all given through Moses. Uh, on top here, it is on his head, he had a uh, crown. It's called a mitre in the old King James Version, but uh, it is simply a covering for his head and a band round here which said, Holiness to the Lord indicating that his thoughts were also to be holy in God's sight. Then he had on here a breastplate. 
in which there were 12 beautiful stones, and on each of those stones was inscribed the names of one of the tribes of Israel, indicating that he bore these on his heart. And then we have here a, a, a Urim and a Thummim. Now, they were used to indicate the good pleasure or the, uh, the negative will of God. Uh, if one lighted up, it was yes. If the other one had a cloud on it, it was no. And so answers could be found when inquiries were made from God. Then behind that is what is known as the ephod. And on the shoulder here, there were two stones, and on these were inscribed the names of the 12 sons of Israel. Then down here, he had a beautiful blue garment, and this seems to be God's favorite color, you know, and I think there's a lot of significance in this blue. It indicates a royal color that God has, and uh, the Israelites also were supposed to wear a band of blue. And then there was this sash here. It's uh, called a curious girdle, uh, meaning it's a very special one. And then, of course, he had his incense uh, censer, which he waved before the Lord with the incense in it. And then right down at the bottom, you'll notice there are some bells and little pom-poms. They were representing pomegranates. And as the high priest walked, these bells would no doubt tinkle. Can I do this, Mr. Winterton? Yeah, they, they must have been very nice. And so the people would know the high priest's movements as he moved around the sanctuary. So then, this is ancient Shiloh, and this is where it all happened. This is where the sanctuary of Israel was. Later on, of course, when Solomon built his beautiful temple on Mount Moriah, this whole sanctuary concept was incorporated in Solomon's temple. Of course, what is there now is not Solomon's temple. It's the Dome of the Rock, a Muslim mosque, the first part of which was built in the 7th century AD. But nevertheless, that is where Solomon's temple once stood. Now, what was the purpose of this sanctuary? Why all these animal sacrifices, all this bloodletting? Do we assume that God is a sort of an angry God that has to be appeased by the slaying of animals? No, that's not the idea at all. It was all symbolic, typical, all pointing forward to what Jesus Christ was going to do for the human race. You know, when Jesus went to the River Jordan, John the Baptist pointed to him and said in John 1, 29, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now you see, Jesus is referred to as the Lamb of God, just the same as these sacrificial lambs were offered, an innocent lamb for a guilty victim, so Jesus Christ died for the guilty sins of the world. And that was the very heart of the sanctuary service. But the sanctuary itself was also highly symbolical, typical. Over here in the book of Hebrews, and in chapter 8 it says, Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected and not man. Now that's interesting, isn't it? It tells us that God made a sanctuary. And really this sanctuary here at Shiloh was really just a tiny little insignificant model of that great sanctuary of God in heaven. Now, of course, the temple of God in heaven is nothing like this one here. Magnificent, immense, 10,000 times 10,000 of angels can crowd in there. So this is only a very small model. But the temple is there all right. I'm reading in Revelation chapter 15 and in verse 5 where it says, After these things I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. So when John was carried up into heaven in vision, he saw this temple opened. He looked inside. It was a real temple. I personally think it was just as real and solid as the sanctuary that was pitched right here in Shiloh or that was built in the temple of God in Jerusalem. It's a real place. Heaven is very real to me. The things of eternity mean something. They're very meaningful, very real. All right, now John not only saw the temple opened, but just the same as this sanctuary on earth had various articles of furniture, 
So, John saw the same things in heaven. For instance, in Revelation chapter 1, and in verse 18 it says here, verse 12, Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. So just the same as there were seven lampstands here in the sanctuary on earth, John saw them right there in heaven too. Not only that, in Revelation chapter 8, and in verse 3, I think it is, let's find it, yes. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar, and he was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. So, okay, the sanctuary on earth had a golden altar of incense. There it was in heaven. So the one on earth was just a copy, a little copy of the great altar in heaven. And finally, we notice the most important feature of the earthly sanctuary was a copy of that in heaven too. Listen, Revelation 11 and verse 19. Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. So John saw it up there. There it was. So you see, this sanctuary on earth was just a little model, a type of the great temple of God in heaven. I want you to see the significance of what is here. Here is the high priest wearing the names of the 12 tribes of Israel on his heart. He has a responsibility for them. He carries them on his heart. Now remember, this high priest is a type or a symbol of our great high priest in heaven, Jesus Christ, who day by day is looking after us and offering his sacrifice on our behalf and he bears our names on his heart. Every one of you, he's got your name written there. If you believe in him, he's got your name there. You see, it says here in Hebrews chapter 7 and in verse 25, therefore he is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him since he ever lives to make intercession for us. You see, we need somebody to intercede on our behalf. We are sinners. We've done things that are wrong. We deserve to be put to death. But Jesus Christ died for our sins, and so he steps in between a loving God and the sinner and says, I died for that person, intercedes on our behalf. And it's not that God is reluctant to forgive us. He is so happy when Jesus Christ is able to confess us as his children. And the result? Well, it tells us here in Hebrews chapter 4 and in verse 15, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. He knows what it is to be tempted. He lived in this world of temptation. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Don't be afraid to come to Christ. You might say, oh yes, but I'm a sinner. I've done so many bad things. I'm ashamed. Okay, you're the person who needs Christ. You can come pleading that Christ died on your behalf and you can come boldly with your prayers. You can say, I stand before God just as if I'd never sinned because Christ died for my sins. This is what it means to have a great high priest in heaven. Well, that sounds encouraging. Maybe the sanctuary truth is the key that unlocks the old Bible prophecy in Daniel chapter 8, where we're told that until 2,300 days and then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Daniel was given this prophecy in the old Persian town of Shushan, and that's where we'll be taking you in the next program.